I'll assume it's time to start. And I should get by the right page. Huh? Let's start with um, 30 seconds of quiet time to get uh, in sync with the Lord by confession and restoration of, of uh, fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Let's start now. Jesus, Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, for your blessing on this time that we're together in your word to help us to just set everything aside for the time being to be with you, your word, your Holy Spirit, the true teacher of the word of God at all times, always. And I pray, Lord, uh, you just bless us that we may um, seek this knowledge to, uh, of Scripture, not just for ourselves, but, Lord, also for, um, for, um, for your plan and how you uh, have us... Um, live our lives to manifest you in every way. We ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Hi, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, so let's start with um, Tuesday's class. Not up there, but Tuesday's class will be, I'll just put it up there, will be at the same time, um, 7 p.m., Um, just as a note, um, next week I believe is turning the turning the clock back an hour. So I think it's fall back, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So make sure you adjust your clock. Um, Facebook pop, will pop up anyway, but <laughs> but that'll just let you know. Um, let's orient ourselves for a second, a second with a couple of things. Um, we've just finished. We'll be starting verse ten. We've finish up verse 9, and um, where that is, is that if you remember, we find ourselves in a parenthesis, and what that means, that parenthesis, is verse 9, 10, and 11, and we already finished the first one, which was about salvation, and a parenthesis has a very specific purpose. Um, why is the purpose of a parenthesis? It's so that the God, the Holy Spirit, can issue us some doctrines and for this case, uh, Paul, for the Philippians and for us, some doctrines that need to be shared with us uh, kind of instantaneously to orient ourselves within the subject matter of the chapter, of the, of the, of the paragraphs that we're in. And reality is that what happens, and we'll, we'll cover it down here too, is that when you come to a parenthesis, the parenthesis stopped in verse 8, and it's jumping over to verse 12, okay? So, the, what happens is that the end of verse 8 will start again on verse 12, not on verse 9. This, the, many times parentheses are what they call axiomatic, which means that they are, um, uh, they, they're, they're separated with kind of footnotes in between them, okay, for us. So the first one, Paul meant was salvation. And this one here is the phase two. Uh, and as you remember, we were talking about phase two with respect to, um, I put it up before, I'll show you where it's at in this one. Phase two is the believer in time. And this is the focus of this particular piece. So we have phase one is salvation, right? We have it in verse nine. And then we have phase two, which is, you know, the time that we're saved to the time that we die physically. Uh, so here, to here, that's phase two, this is phase one here, and this is from here to here, and then the next verse will be uh, phase three, which will be eternity, and that will be here, and so these are done that way. It's, it's, it's important to know where they're at, because they have very specific, they're addressing the scripture that way. Um, before I forget, because I have to see stuff. A friend of ours, Gene and Mines, a very good friend of ours, sent me a video. And 
What was cool about the video, there's lots of cool about it, it's actually about end times, which you know in about two months, hopefully sooner, we'll be going back to Revelation 13, which is exactly the chapter where this piece takes place. And, um, but there's a, remember I was talking about Judaizers, and I mentioned that we have Judaizers in our own time. And you know that I actually don't spend much time on those people um, because um, there's many more important scriptures and doctrine to know. But this particular guy was interesting, so I thought, I, since I actually ran into him on a video and I listened to what he said, his name is Rabbi, oops, maybe I should start with an R, Rabbi, I just want to mention him, because he is a Judaizer, M-A-B-B-I, he's a uh, previous Jew, he called himself a Jew, um, I'll, I'll explain that in a minute, and it's John, E-O-N-A-T-H-A-N, Khan, C-A-H-N, is his last name, and he's what they call a Messianic Jew, in reality, and he is a present time Judaizer, okay, and he happily happens to be a Jew uh, from the beginning, from, from birth, and was, that's why he has a name rabbi in front of him. But he is what a so-called messianic Jew, and um, which is a unbiblical term. Um, it is actually kind of like being a, how much trouble can I get into? Um, kind of like being a, a Native American, let's put it that way. Is that, uh, let me well, the reason I make that joke is, is that, there is no such, either you are a believer and you're a Christian in our time, or you're not. There's nothing in between the two, okay? Um, and so he is a person who is bringing prophecy, specifically in time prophecy, inserting all this kind of a, I'll call it a Judaism um, a structure, and, that, and inserting it into Christianity. Um, and as you know, there is a place for... Judaism with respect to the Old Testament, but Judaism today is a dead faith, okay? It's dead because it doesn't have Jesus Christ in it, okay? But the, the point of this is, don't you know, they are still there. They still are influencing many uh, believers. Many of the believers I actually know, uh, many of them are Christian leaders who I actually admire in many ways of their lives. We may not see, you know, exactly head to head on doctor, but I admire them. And he is a great influencer in that movement. In fact, he actually is a great influencer in the movement in the United States with respect to Christianity, with respect to Mike Pence. Uh, I haven't heard him associate with Donald Trump, but he uses Trump a lot in, in some of this stuff. So it's very interesting, but getting him off there, I thought that was interesting since I had run into him. I would let you know now I know the name of actually a Judaizer in our own time. And it was, what it lets you know, too, is that um, there is never a time when um, that Satan does not introduce somebody into Christianity to move them away from his word, uh, from, from, the, uh, from Christianity itself. And could, Christianity is unique, even though its foundation sits on uh, Judea, um, Judeo and, um, uh, Judean, Christi uh, Judean faith. Okay, it sits on it because it sits on the Old Testament. Um, so I thought it was interesting since it came up, I think even last week, and um, it was worth mentioning. Uh, if you want to listen to somebody like that, it is kind of interesting to hear them. Um, I caution you because not enough people know enough of their scripture to sort it out. And um, you have to have a, a fair amount. If you went through all the revelations so far, uh, the first 12 chapters that we did, you'll be able to sort most of it out if you have good notes. <clears throat> okay, if you don't, then you may actually think what he's saying is true. So let's go to verse 10 here. So we know where we're at, we're right here, uh, the believer in time. And this is the critical time for us, okay? Uh, salvation is obviously critical. Uh, without it, you're not even in the plan, okay? Uh, but this is a critical piece for us and kind of tells us where we're at. Um, the, the piece where it says, he says, um, I want, I want to know Christ, this is um, Paul speaking, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and, to, and the participation in his suffering, becoming like him in death. Okay, I'll read the translation here. 
a similar interlinear, but a translation, a good one, um, that I may come to know him. How do, you come, how, do you, how do you come to know Jesus Christ? Bible study, right? Not a second way to know him. Um, and it says, in the power of his resurrection, okay, and participating in his suffering, uh, taking on the same form of suffering, that's the key part, I want you to get that piece, I put it up here for that reason, um, with reference to his death. Um, and the, the piece here that it's talking about is, uh, as I've written down these notes, the power of his resurrection is to understand the power of God through Bible doctrine. Okay, and that's what he's saying here, is really to know that. Um, the power of the resurrection in the case of Jesus Christ, we talked about last week a little bit, is the, that God the Father and God the Holy Spirit raised Jesus, the man, okay, uh, from the dead. That's important to understand because if that's not true, like Acts tells us, I think it's Acts, um, I think it's Acts 15, this says is, is that if, if, if Christ was not raised from the dead, raised from the dead, that our faith is, is worthless. So resurrection is a key piece of our, of our scriptures and certainly of our theology and our faith. Um, so he, this, all this piece about the resurrection is really to understand the power of God, you know, <clears throat> what happens through, through uh, scripture. And the piece here on the, um, on the, um, uh, the participation in the suffering I may mention, mention this last week, but this is, um, this is the word koinonia. Okay, it's the same word we've used in other places. It means to have a fellowship with that suffering. Okay, a lot of people, a lot of Christians get off the road on, on this particular uh, suffering because in reality, the only suffering that you can share with Christ is the opposition of Satan in your life, okay, um, in your personal life. And that does not happen to people unless they are an actual challenge to uh, Satan and his cosmic system, okay? In reality, if they are not a challenge to it, Satan is just as happy that most Christians are already neutralized, okay? So he has no issue with you. So that's what he's saying here, is that he's sharing in that suffering. <clears throat> and this suffering is in his life, not the cross, okay? Um, in reality, you cannot share in the suffering that Christ had on the cross. <clears throat> okay, the reason you can't you can't um, sharing that particular side is because it is unique to Christ because he was the perfect sacrifice, okay? So the only other suffering that you can share with him is the suffering of the opposition that, that happens to us as a matter of living a holy life where we are Christ-like in maturity, okay? So it comes up over here, and it's actually talking about a mission, okay? <clears throat> For us, it's, it, um, I, I paralleled them here, although in places they're not parallel, okay? But I thought it'd be kind of fun to do it. Um, when this, is the, this is the first 30 years of Jesus' life right here. And if you remember, if you're familiar with this, in reality, uh, Jesus did not have um, suffering and he didn't have those kind of struggles that we're aware of prior to, the, um, to his beginning of his mission. In the beginning of his mission, started with John the Baptist at the baptism, okay? And that's when his mission actually started. Uh, and that has a lot of historical meaning for the fact that he's 30 years old and the fact that he's Jewish. It's very, and historically, it's, it's put in there. So his mission starts, it's only for three and a half years. Most people will agree with that because they can count the Passovers in it. And it kind of comes into, the, into that area, maybe three, three and a half years, something in that territory. Um, but what I want to, it, it, the death it's talking about here um, will be the one, that's the next piece we're going to cover, will not be his spiritual death, okay? It will be his physical death, okay? And so uh, we, we kind of want to make that clear because you can't participate in that suffering, okay? Because it's unique to Christ as the as the as the Lamb of God and as the perfect man in reality he um, he is uniquely qualified and we are not okay one of the things that makes him uniquely qualified is the fact that he doesn't have a sin nature because of the virgin birth okay he only has half of the the genes from his mother so it gives it it's the actual foundation of his ability to go to the cross if he had had a uh, if there had not been a virgin birth he would have had the old sin nature 
and who would not have been qualified to die on the cross for our sins because he would have had that sin nature. The same thing that contem condemns us would have condemned him, okay, for, for the need of a Savior. Um, interesting enough that Jesus in here, um, the baptism kind of equates somewhat with we get born, in reality we're not saved until we have faith in Christ, okay? And that's in the, that moment, the baptism of the Holy Spirit brings us into union with Christ, fills us with the Holy, uh, the Holy Spirit initially, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit gives us eternal life, imputes the righteousness of Christ. All those things happen, okay, uh, like the 36 things we talked about. And this is when our mission starts, okay? It doesn't start back here, okay? Um, and it, it, for us, it has to start at the moment of salvation, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that prepares us for the ability to live a Christ-like life, okay? Um, so, and we'll cover this piece in a minute. And this is our plan like this. This is, Jesus had his plan, and his plan was to uh, be the author and perfecter of our faith. That's one of the things he did, the during part. Uh, he showed us Emmanuel, Christ on earth, Christ with us. He, that was that piece like that, so we can look at Christ and see those things. And the second thing what it does is his really end game mission was the cross. Okay? Now notice the cro that the cross right here, I did not put it side by side with the physical death. Um, but it has, a, it has a parallel for us. Okay? His physical death was the consummation of his um, mission. Mission accomplished, right? Okay? He accomplished that. Our physical death matches up with his physical death as the end of our mission, okay, um, as the potential, okay. Now, most Christians today, I, I don't think even understand that they're in a mission, that they have a purpose, and that that purpose is the purpose of God. Um, do, 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 do. I have to push a button here. There we go. Uh, sorry about that. And um, so his mission is over here, and it's completed at physical death. Why does, why does Jesus, why does his spiritual death not match up with his physical death, okay? Um, why does Jesus physically die, okay? Um, and I just want to give you a quick answer to that. It's a long answer, but it's a quick one. Uh, at least one I'm going to give. Is that he dies physically for two reasons. One, um, because his mission is done, okay? Two, he has to fulfill the second part of a mission beyond life, which is the resurrected life, come back as the resurrected Christ, which he does three days after, three days and three nights. And then he is on the earth for 40, 40 days and 40 nights. And then he goes through, uh, so we have the resurrection, and then 40 days later we have the ascension. And then in heaven he has the session, which means that he presents his gift to God the Father. And that this is accepted and he gets crossed over to be the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, one that is accepted, okay? And that has a parallel for us, okay? So the, the, the point is that the, watch our parallel that we have. We've talked about this thing the entire time, and understanding it is, is well understood when, when it talks about um, bearing the cross, okay? When it says that to, to bear our cross. There is no real cross for us, but that cross is an analogy of the mission that we have, which is the mission that God has given to us in His plan, okay? And that's spiritual maturity. So you see, the, um, we talked about these phases before. For us, I'm going to parallel with that, um, and this is the ideal plan, okay? This is not the plan that the great majority of Christians uh, participate in because they choose not to, okay? They're distracted by things. And we'll talk about that when we get down to, to here. Um, but what they do is that the first piece of that uh, piece is salvation, and then the piece is to be maturity, and we've, we've talked about the purpose of maturity. The purpose of maturity is to equip the, the saints to live the plan that God has designed for them. That's his purpose, okay? So uh, once we do that, we have to learn enough to be effective, okay? And reality is that you cannot live an effective Christian life without Bible doctrine because you have no direction and you don't know how to use the power of God, which means that you are at the mercy of the power of Satan, okay? Um, in case you didn't know, this is why, this is why that scripture says, in my weakness I am strong, okay? It's because in my weakness, as, as a Christian, as Paul was, and as you are, that weakness is 
the decision that we don't have enough power to live the life that God put before us. So we humble ourselves. And when you humble yourselves, uh, you confess your sin and you humble yourself, the power of the Holy Spirit and the truth of God as, your, uh, as the power systems that you live are the power systems of God himself. Okay? And they are more powerful than the cosmic demonic power. Okay? So what happens to us as human beings is that when we are not submitted to God, the world power actually overcomes us. This is, in, um, this is actually shown very clearly in Romans 8 verses 1 through 8. In reality is that we can't live the power of God's life. We can't live a Christian life uh, in our own power. We don't have that kind of power as human beings. So we borrow our power, okay? And we borrow that power by confession of sin, the Holy Spirit, Okay, now it becomes the power system I live in. And we borrow the power of not human thinking, but God's thinking. Okay, that's the power of the Word. Okay, and using those two together allows me to live a godly life, a mature life. But if I'm not, if I don't use those powers, I am weak, I am on my own. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. So, and this will, will come up in this piece right here. This is the pressing on that will occur in, in the verses from 12 to 19. And then we will go through then and we will, we will physically die here, okay? We'll physically die and what will happen, uh, this, is a, this is actually a step. This is a, a grace, maturity, and then we're going to be talking about, when we get to verse 12, of maximum security. That shows up as the it over here. Okay, we'll get to that. But I want to show you here so we can see where it's at. That's the maximum maturity. It's what Paul's talking about and reveals in verse 12 and, and, and forward uh, so that we know what it is. So what happens to us is we die. If we die, if I die today, and I would go into an uh, interim body, a resurrection body, not a resurrection body like Christ, but an interim body that I can use uh, in the eternal state because I can't use my physical one. And so what would happen is that the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ right here, is where we would receive our rewards, okay? This is the part here with, um, I have a verse on this somewhere, but yeah, not till verse 13. So we'll get through it in verse 13. But I want to show you what it is. We'll get our rewards at the judgment seat of Christ, which is also called uh, Bema seat. Bema just means seat, is what it means. Um, but that will happen at the rapture. So if I die today and the rapture is next year, I will be in the interim body for that year. And when the rapture takes place, I would be the dead in Christ that come down with him and, and then meet the people who are translated in the air. And then at that point, we receive our resurrection body. You've seen that. And when we go to heaven at that point, the judgment seat of Christ takes place and the rewards are given out. Okay? And we'll get to that because it shows up in verse uh, 14. But over here, so we have, we have the rapture, and this, this reward is for the Nikahu only, okay? Uh, at least everything that's revealed shows that this is the Nikahu only. Um, especially the higher, the higher rewards that are shown are, are there. Um, but look at the parallel here. As Jesus Christ in his physical death and the ascension, the, and the ascension achieve the title of King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That is given to Jesus Christ the man. Why? Because he accomplished his mission 100%. He says that in Revelation 2 and 3. He says, those who overcome like I overcame, we're on the same level. We're in the same, not the same level, but we, we, are, uh, we are the Nikah. We are the overcomers. Okay, that's the, the Greek word for that. So what happens is that our rewards, the Nikah only, will parallel that at the judgment seat of Christ, we will be rewarded as he is rewarded. And we'll cover that in verse 14 when we get there. But note the, note the exact same structure that God the Father gave to Jesus Christ. God the Father is the planner. Jesus didn't come up with his own plan. He actually followed the exact plan of God the Father. Okay, That's why he says, and all the things he talks about in Scripture, he says, I do not do what I want to do. I only do what my Father tells me to do, okay? It's very simple, very similar parallel to we have the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, and what do we know from John 8, chapter 8, is we know that, that the Holy Spirit will only speak the things that what? Jesus says, okay? So, he is, he is the time, the dispensation, the time period that we're in, he, the Holy Spirit will only speak the truth that is given by Jesus Christ. So we find the same 
uh, attitude that we have the son following the, the, the father. And we also follow the father. This is not Jesus' plan. This is God the Father's plan. How do we know it? It's because it's written in the scriptures. What we do is that we follow Jesus Christ because we, when we use the power systems that he used, which were filling of the Holy Spirit without measure, that's what he had, and the complete scripture, which he obviously is the author of, okay, author and perfecter of our faith, he is the one who showed us how to do this. That's why these things parallel. Okay, this is only for the mature believers. These are the ones who are going into maturity. The other ones are called cosmic believers because they follow the world system. Okay, and for them they get no reward, although they do become saved, and that'll come up later on too. So this is the participation in the suffering. As we go into maturity, we will suffer uh, persecution um, and opposition by. Um, by Satan's, people who are on Satan's side. Now, we know from Scripture, both on Jesus' side and on Paul's side, this was always the religious, okay? And for Paul, it was always other Christians. The Judaizers were Christians who had, who had gone to Judaize them. Um, we're familiar with um, uh, Alexander the coppersmith, as we talk about Demas and Hymenaeus and other ones. But they were believers who actually persecuted Paul the entire time. So most of the time that when you walk with the Lord, the persecution doesn't come from unbelievers, the persecution comes from believers. Okay, that sounds odd, but if you look at the examples, that's always true. Um, the people who, who, who executed Christ and scream, execute him, you know, you know uh, put him on the cross, execute him, execute him. Who were they? They were his brothers, right? They were Jews, okay? It wasn't the Romans, remember? Remember what the Romans said? Remember what Pontius Pilate said? I see nothing wrong with him, man. I wash my hand of this. I'm not guilty, okay? And then the Jews who were, the, the, Jew, uh, the Jews who were of, of Jesus' exact faith, are the ones who said, we will take his blood upon ourselves and our children. Okay? So that just sets you, sets you up. So you, so you understand who the suffering is done by. You would think it would be done by people who were, um, and it is, it can be, but the, the greatest actually persecutors of, um, of the mature are the Christians, not, uh, not unbelievers. So I want to get this last piece here. It's participating in his suffering. This is satanic opposition. That's what we would call it. That's what we would participate in just like Jesus participated in. Okay? We take on his suffering. We have fellowship with that suffering. It means that we, it's part of our lives. We participate in his sufferings through the uh, satanic opposition. And we talked about this earlier in uh, the suffering that mature people do. Um, to let you know that um, people who are not maturing do not suffer in this same suffering. Now, what they generally do is they generally, we'll talk about them too, uh, when we get past, I think it's verse nine, uh, 19, they will suffer as a result of, of uh, choosing against God. Okay, Most believers make bad decisions, um, and because of those bad decisions, they, they suffer the consequences. If they stay out of fellowship with the Lord long enough, they actually die the sin to death, and we'll talk about that in the last three verses of this, which is, but that's believers who are, that's happening to, okay? It's on verse uh, 20, 20, no, 19, 20, and 21. Um, so just to let you know so that that's all there. So the piece I want to get to in here is this, that um, he says, um, we take on the same uh, form, it says, becoming like him in his death, okay? And it, what that piece is, this is talking to the mature believers. He's talking to mature believers. And the opportunity for everybody else to take on, uh, in reality, is to be, take on that Christ-likeness, okay? Uh, is that we become Christ-like. And we ultimately, that's the subject of this thing because it's talking about phase two, we're coming up right to that line and ultimately take on the death of Christ, meaning that at the, at the moment that we die, <clears throat> we actually go into this, this um, place where we have the rewards of Christ in his death, okay? In his death. He died, he died physically, completed his mission, and became the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords as a result 
of his death. He didn't take it on this side, remember? He was spat on, he was, he was beaten, he, all these other things happened, nailed on the cross. None of that happened on this side, it all happened on the other side. Once he died, he received that honor and title forever. Okay, when we look at uh, chapter, Revelation chapter 19, it's very, there's a piece in there where it says, he was the king of many crowns, okay? He took those crowns on in, in actuality at the point of death. And the same thing for us, <clears throat> we will take that on at the death being like him in that exact same piece, okay? We are given the honor <clears throat> of living a life and, like him and suffering like he did in opposition to the satanic world and then coming to that part of, uh, of death where we suffer the similar death, which means we walk through that phase and we are honored there as a result of that, okay? Our honor comes afterwards, um, and this is another parallel, when he completed his mission, I'll just draw it here, okay? For the great majority of the thing, he completed his mission, okay? Where was that? That's the cross. But he didn't die, right? He died shortly afterwards, okay, where he had his physical death, okay? And then he went three days and three nights in the grave, right? That's when he, we're not even going to get into that, but he did a lot of that. Then he was for 40 days, okay, there's three days here. 40 days, he was on the earth, right? And then he did the, so the resurrection is here. Um, the ascension is here, okay, this is 10 days before Pentecost. And he went up, and he had the session, probably the same day, I suspect, he didn't have any trouble flying eternity, uh, and he got the session here. And this is where he received that award. Note that there's a, there is a space there, okay? A very similar space happens with us. We physically die, okay? We live in the interim body, whatever that is, okay? That's the eternal spot where we cross into eternity. And then at the judgment seat of Christ, okay, we get our rewards, Okay, so the, the, this, the parallels here are just ridiculous. Um, that there, there are so many parallels to it that they follow the same plan, that they follow the same uh, place. Okay, so, so that's becoming like him. And like I said here, that's, that's suffering in his life, not the cross. Don't be confused. You don't have the ability to have any participation in the cross. Zero. It's, a, it's an act of grace. That we, that we participate in the divine life. So we become like him in his death, okay? That's where we, in his death. Takes place, we go to the other side just like that. So that's a piece of that that fits there. Now we're going to talk about verse 11. I think I got everything I need to do. Da, 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 da. Um, other than the fact that, like I said, many, many believers, if you have to look at the subject, he, he's giving an axiom here. But this axiom applies to all believers with potential, they have the ability to, whether they participate in this, whether they ever seek the knowledge of God, the power of God, the, the, the resurrection, whether they ever participate in fellowship in the suffering like Christ, will only happen if they mature, and whether they ever become like Him, this is potential. Okay? That's all potential, specific to the Nikahu. Okay, everybody, the unbelievers will follow that path, but whether they will get any of this, and specifically this, depends on their volition, okay, what they choose. Um, so let's go to verse 11, okay, down here. And this is the phase three. We're still in the parenthesis, remember? We covered for phase one with phase two, and now he's going to give us an axiomatic statement at the finish line. Okay, that's really what this is. Really, it's crossing the finish line. Okay, very short. We can just kind of tag it here. He says, and, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Now, note that that word is singular in the English. It's dead. But the Greek word is plural. Okay, it's not singular. It's plural. And so um, you kind of have to look behind it. So what, what deaths... What deaths could it be talking about in the plural? Okay. Now this is where this is where Bible doctrine helps you sort it out. Okay. Is it possible that we could be participating in his physical death? I mean, his spiritual death and the physical death? Uh, hopefully, doctrine tells you that's not possible. Okay. 
Uh, we will not have any sins put on us and be separated from God. We put our own sins on ourselves and separate us from God. We are not like Jesus in that effect. So the question is, what does that mean? Okay. Um, and even though I get, you know, it's sometimes tough. I'll, I'll read the, I'll read the, the translation because I think it'll make a lot more sense. If in some way I may, no potential, cross the finish line to the res, uh, to the resurrection, which is away from the dead ones. Okay, that's a different word, huh? Now, this, that's two pieces that we did there. One, we, um, we did two things. I'll get in a little bit of trouble with this one. But we translated the word like it is. Deads. Deads. Okay? <laughs> deads. Well, we don't have the word deads, but, um, but note that it's plural. It means more than one death. Okay? So we have to figure out what does that word mean. Um, the other part is that what we use is that we use this word here um, as it's, it's an adjective, okay, and it's plural, and what we're and it's masculine, and what we do is we we change the I'm gonna get in trouble. We change this adjective um, into what's called a substantive. Okay, nobody wants to hear that stuff, but so you don't listen to that part. A substantive means that you change something into a um, uh, a category. Okay, it means that you you kind of we do it all the time in English. Okay, um, I take running to runner. Okay, uh, and so you, you, there's a lot of times when you put a and this is this is in the Greek. So what you do is that you actually put it here. Um, you change it by doing it by changing it to the stance of the sense of is that this becomes the dead ones. The is what you add to it. You add an adjective. The dead ones. And this is, like I said, it's very common in the, um, the dead ones. So who are the dead ones? See, it has to be plural. Can't get rid of the plural just because you don't like it. Um, and like I said, there are many, many times in the scriptures where it talks about Jesus dying and says, and Jesus' death. In reality, it's a plural, and the person who's translating it ignores the pluralness. Okay? That is a harm, it is a foul, it is a... You should be slapped for doing that. You have a responsibility to translate it even if you don't like what it says, even if you can't explain it. Okay? So the dead ones here is a, like remember I said, it's axiomatic. Okay? That's the part that, what axiom could the Lord Holy Spirit be telling us as a part of phase one, two, and three? Okay? The word here, the, the preposition here, is the word ek. Okay? And ek means from away from. Okay, that's what it means. And so this would be translated, as I, as I showed there, uh, uh, out from, out from the dead ones. Okay, and in this case, these ones are the dead ones here. Okay, the dead ones. What are the dead ones? They are the ones who never come to life, okay, with respect to God's system. So, and the dead ones, and the plurality, is an axiomatic statement that he is saying that this is a separation that he may, okay? That may. Why does he say may? It's because it's a potentiality of the of the axioms, okay? When I give you the rules, I tell you what the axiom says. I I tell I I talk about salvation, even though you're saved, okay? That's why. That's what an axiom does. It it, it divorces itself, but it, it prints out the rules, okay? That's what an axiom is. Is a rule. So, what this tells us is that out from the dead ones is that you have two different types of believers that we're familiar with, okay? And we only have one kind of unbeliever, okay? And this is a choice. Unbelievers are the dead ones, okay? They are never given eternal life. Um, they are dead in their transgressions. We kind of go on and on, okay? But that's what these ones are. That is the only thing that you can make from that with the plurality and not ignore it. But the believers actually come in pairs, okay? And this would be one pair of believers. Many, many, uh, hopefully many believers are nikao, which means that they are winners. They are overcomers like Christ. They're the ones that I've shown up here. But many, many more of those believers are cosmic believers. And cosmic meaning that they participate, this means worldly, they participate and live as worldly people. Now a lot of times, um, people who are believers who live in the cosmic system, like I said, feel like they have, they have missed 
uh, that, that they are being persecuted. Um, and most of the time, what happens is that they are not being persecuted. They have actually caused their own problems by choosing against the Word of God. God says, go this way. They choose that way. And by choosing that way, there is a consequence of penalty. Okay? It's kind of like um, if somebody tells me, you know something? Do not walk down the middle of Pyramid Highway with your eyes closed at night. And I go, I'm not going to listen to that. That sounds like, well, I have freedoms and rights. I can do whatever I want to. Okay? Um, I can do that. And I will meet the Lord much sooner than most of you would be. Okay? That's called a natural consequence of a bad decision. Okay? God didn't make me do it. He didn't harm me. I just chose to do something that was opposite of what he instructs in prudent people to do. Um, so... That kind of summarizes it down to where we're at. Now we are out of the parentheses. So let's go to verse 12. Now that we're out of the parentheses. And this is an important piece here. Um, and many times if you can't identify a parenthesis, um, parenthetical verses, what you will do is you will try to read them together. Okay? And the problem is that they're not meant to be together. Parenthesis means they have a gap between them. Okay? So I'm going to read verse 12. Um, and then I'm going to, it, it, now we've passed out of the parentheses of those verses, and we're going to read verse 12. And it says, uh, not that I have, all, uh, I have obtained all it, or this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. That is a fantastic verse, okay? But note that it doesn't make any sense on the end of dead ones. Okay, so let's try it one more time, and when we put it where it's supposed to be at the end of verse 8. Okay, so I'm going to read verse 8, and then we're going to go from 8 to 10, ignoring the parentheses because we've already studied it. Okay, what is more, this is what Paul's saying, this is uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. He says, What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Note the knowing. Okay. Why does he keep saying knowing? It's because if you do not study Bible doctrine every single day, you will not know Jesus Christ. You will not know the power of his resurrection. Stuff we were talking about earlier. Okay? So he said, for whose sake I have lost all things. Remember, that was a previous category of celebrity ship, which human celebrity ship and Hebrew celebrity ship, Paul certainly had. And he gave it all up to have nothing but Jesus Christ. Um, he says, I consider them garbage. We talked about what that garbage meant. That I may gain Christ. Verse 12. Not that I have already obtained all of this. Okay, talking about his direction. Or that I have already arrived at my goal. But I press on to take hold of that which Christ um, took hold of me. Okay, so I want to just stop there for a second. And I want to read these two verses because we've ended the parentheses, we jumped to verse 12, we read it, now those verses are matched up. That's what it has to do with, okay? <clears throat> but I want to read these two because this is part of the decision that has to be made by the believer who takes this path. And hopefully you got these two. But I like, the, I like these, these are two of my really favorite pieces. Uh, one of them is Joshua 5. Verses 14 through 15. And if you remember the context of this, it's in the Old Testament, where Joshua is about to lead the Israelites over, to, uh, over the Jordan River into the Promised Land. Okay? And uh, if you remember, he is taken over from Moses. Moses died. Uh, the Lord took him. And now that whole mantle falls onto Joshua. And I have, to, I have to actually read the first part of this. Sorry about that. Let me tell you one second. Uh, maybe if I get in the right spot. There we go. Well, Joshua. I want to read the beginning of it uh, so, I can, so you actually understand the answer. 5.14. There we go. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, he says, now Joshua, this is a verse before, I should have typed this up. He says, um, now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked him, this is the, I'll call it the pregnant question, okay? This is the question that, that's a critical question. Are you for us or for our enemies? Okay? Now we can go to the answer. The answer here is, this is the captain of the Lord's army. This is 
This is Jesus Christ himself manifest as the angel of the Lord. And here, called the, the captain of the commander of the Lord's armies, which we know that he is as the angel of the Lord. And his answer is no answer. He says, neither. Okay? He says, neither. Whose side are you on, Joshua says? Our side? Or enemies? And his answer, the Lord says, is neither. This is really an important thing to understand, okay? Is that as a believer, okay, mature believers don't have a side. We don't have a side. That's what Joshua's lesson was here, okay? Joshua was mixed up, okay? He was mixed up in that he, he equated his side with God's side, okay? And many times as Christians, we equate our side with God's side. And that's not the how it is. It's God's side, if we submit ourselves, is our side. His side is our side. We don't have a side, okay? Um, and, he, and he answers this very well. Listen, listen, listen to the response of Joshua in verse 15. Let's, let's go 14 first, finish this off. He says, neither, he replied, but as the, as the commander of the army of the Lord, I have come. Then Joshua fell to his face in the ground in reverence and asked him, listen to this, he says, what message does my Lord have to his servant? That's the response of a mature believer. That's the response of a, of a believer who doesn't have a side. Okay? It's a response. He says, what does my Lord have for his servant? Okay? Instruct me. And that is the position that we as mature believers and Paul has all the time. What does the instruction of my Lord have? And where do we get those instructions? We get those for our time in the church age. We get those instructions in Bible study. That's where they come from. Okay? Now he finishes and says that the commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place you are standing is holy. Why is the place where he's standing is holy? It's because he is the Lord Jesus Christ. You get, you get this exact same when, when, the, um, when, when Moses at, is at the burning bush, the Lord says the same thing to him. Take off your sandals, for where you stand is on holy ground. Why is it holy ground? Because the Shekinah glory of Jesus Christ is the burning bush is there. Here we have the physical, the captain of the Lord's army, the angel of the Lord, standing in front of him. And because he is standing there, that is holy ground, just like the Holy of Holies. Okay? And Joshua did so which means that he knelt down. The second one I want to go to, so this is the attitude. In reality, Christians, believers who are mature, always recognize that they do not have a side. They only have the side of the Lord. 99% of all the problems Christians get into is because they declare their own side. Okay? That is that my side. Okay? That is a declaration of independence from God. Okay? From a spiritual point of view, that's a declaration of independence. That's the same thing that Satan did when he declared himself above the Holy of Holies. Okay? The second piece here says it's in Luke 10, verses 38 through 42. This is the thing that we as believers have to have. Okay? Right here. This is called Mary's Choice. You're familiar with the story. <clears throat> as Jesus and his disciples were on their way... Um, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She and her sister called Mary, um, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Note where she is. She is in Bible study. Okay, Every word the Lord says, she wants to hear. She's right there. Okay, it says, but Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. Had to be made for what? Jesus being there. Okay? No, so note the, note the difference here. She's distracted because she wants to make sure everything's perfect for Jesus. That's a really great reason, right? But on the other hand, where's Mary? She's at the foot of the Christ, listening to every word that he says. Okay? Um, so Martha, it says, she came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do, all, uh, do, to do the work all by myself? And then, and then she has, first that's the question, and then she has the audacity for the answer here. Mm -hmm. Tell her to help me. Lord, tell her to help me. Okay? And the Lord says, Martha, Martha, 
This is, this is that part you go, oh, Martha, Martha. Okay. You can see him saying it. The Lord says, you, wor you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Okay, and we'll talk about the only one in a second. Mary has chosen the better. That's the only one. Okay? There's only one that's important here. There's only one needed, and Mary has chosen it. And what is that choice? That's to be at the, the, be at the feet of Jesus, listening to him as he speaks scripture out of his mouth. Okay? And it will not be taken away from her, meaning that Jesus will not stop Mary from doing what she's supposed to do. Mary's doing the right thing. Martha, you're doing the wrong thing. And what this tells us is that, and I, and I bring this up because in order to have this, to, to, to be in a mature place, you have to prioritize Bible doctrine above all things, and nothing is more important. It is the bread of life. Okay? It is the, it is the water that flows past the tree. Okay? You have to have it. It is first, and if you do not put it first, you will be like Martha. You will have chosen maybe something that looks perfect to everybody else at church and everything, but in reality, it will be wrong from the Lord's point of view. And Bible doctrine is about the Lord's point of view. So, that is the directional piece. So let's get into this thing. He says, um, let's translate it. He says, not that I have already uh, obtained the objective, that's the it, all of this, okay? The all of this he talks about. Now what's interesting about this particular piece is that that all of this, the it right here, it is the objective, okay? All this is how it's translated, but the root is really it. It is the goal, okay, uh, that he says later on in here. This word is, this, this objective here, and I'll call it objective, is written three times in this verse one time in the next verse, and one time again in the verse after that. So, how often does the Lord tell you something five times in three verses? Okay? What that means is it's in the emphatic. It means it's all you have to pay attention to. This is the point of the entire thing. Okay? So, this piece here is the, is the objective, and he calls it goal. He says, um, as, you, as you see in the piece, he says, or have I already arrived at my goal? Okay? And this goal is not Paul's personal goal, except as that that has been given to him by Paul, the apostle. I mean by Paul, by, by Jesus Christ himself. Sorry about that. Paul, Jesus Christ himself has given him this goal right here. And that goal, we'll see as we go through it what it is. Okay? Um... And he says, note that he says, at this point, this is like 62 AD, he has not uh, achieved it yet. Okay, so what does that tell us? That tells us we know where he's at, right? We know that he is in the peace right here someplace. He's down in here someplace. And the Philippians are following him. Remember, we, we, we talked about that. We put that curve up here. And what he's saying is, I haven't achieved it. Whatever it is, it's in the future, right? I haven't achieved it. Yeah, I have not obtained the goal, okay? Note where the goal of Jesus Christ is at. It's at the end, okay? That's the completed goal. Everything Jesus does here is to accomplish the cross, okay? And that's with us. We need to go through maturity, which is where Paul certainly is. Any idiot who knows anything about Paul knows that at this point in his life, he's in the prison epistles, he is writing some of the most mature doctrine that's written anywhere in the scriptures, beyond everybody else's. And what he's saying, whatever he's saying here, he's saying, I haven't achieved it. And what he's talking about is this maximum secure, maximum maturity that we talked about last week. There is a maturity that is beyond maturity. This is that, remember we talked about before, it says the, the um, super grace, the much more grace, that much more grace, the, the hidden manna, all that stuff. Okay? That's the stuff that God has for those who are not just mature, but pressing on to have even greater maturity. Okay? And it is unique to Christianity in the way that we achieve it. Okay, it's different than Moses achieved it, or Jeremiah achieved it, or them. Um, and what he says here, he says, the word here is the same word, it's the same brace word as the end. Well, where, when Jesus says, it is finished, okay? The word here is, is a teleleo, okay, it's a verb, but it means to, uh, to complete, to reach an objective, okay? But when Jesus said, it is finished, he was talking about his, his goal. It was done. It's finished. 
what was finished? The, the world, um, the, he had paid for the sins of the world. Note that he said that when he was still alive. What does that mean? <clears throat> that means it wasn't in his physical death like you hear all the time. He says, it is finished. He speaks it. It can't be his death. It can't be his physical death if he tells you it was finished in the past tense. Finished, remember? That word is finished has always been, it will be finished forever. It's done, done, done. Okay? And yet he hasn't died. So it tells you that the physical death of Jesus Christ is not his objective. The death of the, of the cross, the spiritual death of having the sins on him that separated his fellowship from God the Father and the Holy Spirit is the death that it's talking about here, okay? So we'll finish, we'll get about, i got about two more minutes I'm going to use and then we're done. But I want to get to this piece that this is in the, this is also in the perfect tense. It means it is something to be completed. It is a perfect objective, meaning that's, that's, that's the end of it. Um, and, it is a, and note that it is also passive, which means that he does not create it, he receives it, okay? The objective he received, okay? Who did receive it from? God the Father is part of his plan. Um, the other part here is that he, he, he has, but he hotly pursues it, he presses on. And he says that, he says, but I press on uh, to take hold of that. And this is, this is a military term. Uh, um, diako o. Um, this is one that means to press on something, to constantly drive at something. What does a Christian do that constantly drives? Bible doctrine. Day after day. Driving. This is why, it's, which why I use the word plugger sometimes, is because it means that you keep driving at it. You keep driving. Every day you drive at it so that you can, you can achieve it. And as you drive day after day, you go up that maturity part to achieve not only maturity, but spiritual maturity. Um, and he says, uh, I, I press on, and it's, and it's in the present active indicative. It means I press on, and I keep on pressing on. That's what Christian, the Christian life is about consistency and about discipline. Okay? Discipline over and over again. Bible study, Bible study, application, Bible study, Bible study, application, over and over and over again. Okay? That's what it is. Um, and I'll leave it here because uh, we're about three minutes and I hate going to, and this has got a little more principles here we have to touch bases on. So we'll come back to that objective. But I want you to know that if you look for this word objective, you will see it, that he writes it over and over again. And he says here, I hotly pursue, I keep on pressing on. And then he says, uh, the third time it's mentioned, uh, to take hold of that which Christ took hold of me for. Which means that Christ saved me so that I could achieve this objective and cross that goal line. Okay? So let's pray. Dearest, gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your great love for us. Thank you for that you put your plan before us. There's no guessing about it. You put it there, you mention it, you talk it over and over and over again. It, goal, accomplishment. And we pray, Lord, that we put our eyes on that, our focus on that. That is the, that's our, des that's our destiny. That is our plan that God has for us and if we don't continually keep it in our minds and continually study so that we are not diverted by it by anything in the world by anybody in the world we will accomplish that and please you and please our father for that plan just like our savior did when he died on the cross both times we ask these things in his precious perfect name as the author and perfecter of our faith amen